Didn't see you there. Welcome to True North Church. It's Super Bowl Sunday. And you know what that means. It's game day. Fun. All right, we're going to honor God with their giving, if you'll stand to your feet. So let me tell you the ways that you can give this morning. You can give online at tnc.sc. You can text to give. You uh, text to the number that's about to be on the screen. And don't forget Wednesday night, small group, 7 o'clock. We have a great time on Wednesday night. Uh, so you're going to text the message TNC to the number 28950, and you'll set it up the first time, and then it'll be easy from there on out. Or you can give by cash or check, or you can put it in the envelope and get credit for it in your taxes. All right. Everybody should have received your tax statements for last year. If you haven't, let us know. You should have received that as uh, in your emails. All right, let's go to the Father. Lord, we love you and praise you. We thank you for this day. We thank you that this is the day that you have made, and we rejoice. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you, Father God. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to to worship together to sing praises and to magnify you and that you inhabit those praises. Father God, we thank you of all the things that you take care of as we're in your presence and we're worshiping you. We thank you in advance, Father God, what's already happening. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to give. Lord, we thank you that every person that gives, we thank you for the blessing on it, to increase it, to multiply it back as you said you would. We thank you every need is met, every bill is paid, for every individual, for every family, for True North Church. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. You you guys are smarter than that. Good morning. It is so good to be in the house of God today. Amen. There is no place I'd rather be on Sunday morning at 1030. I don't know about y'all, but when it's 40 degrees, can you believe the weather? It was 70, 72 degrees yesterday and sunny. And today it's snowing up in Hendersonville. It's crazy. Aren't you glad when we go to heaven, things won't be so uh, turbulent when we get up there, that it'll be just like 68 degrees all the time and the ocean will feel good all the time. You know, it's going to be really nice when we, when we go to heaven. But we're glad you're with us. Um, uh, children are dismissed. We've got our preschoolers dismissed. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm glad you're here. Y'all tell me that you're glad I'm here. Thank you. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you and praise you, and we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father God, that your word is truth. And Lord, we we depend on it. We rely on it. That, Father God, we look to it. We look to it for completion. We look to it for direction. We look to it for, uh, for, for who we are. And Father God, we look to it because you are the author, the perfecter, and the finisher of our faith. And Father, we thank you for that. We praise you for it today. Help us to hear what we need to hear. Father, help, it, help the words to be spoken that need to be spoken. That Father, that you are in what we do and say today. In Jesus' name, amen. Miss um, Terry. Would you mind giving a praise report for me? Miss, we, as many of you know, we prayed for Miss Terry last Sunday. And uh, I think it's important that we know what's going on with Miss Terry because we prayed for her last week. I just want to say God's good all the time. Um, all the negativity that the world was telling me about my health. I choose to believe his word. And so if I believe it, then I'm not sick. So I need to walk as if I'm not. So the report for the lungs, nothing to it. The torn ligament in my foot, I will not have surgery. 
I'm learning how to walk different at 65. The heart cath they're planning on doing, they're not going to find anything. He's got it all. Amen. So we were praying last week for her that she had a couple of tests to be done and um, we're waiting on the heart cath to come back. But the others, we see God working and uh, it's important to hear that because some of us need some encouragement in that area. I do. I need encouragement every once in a while that I would say every day I need encouragement that God works. He's still moving and he's still on the throne. Amen. Amen. Well, turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 4. Today I've titled this Greatest Victory. Greatest Victory. As you know, today is Super Bowl Sunday, but more importantly, it is Flag Football Sunday. And uh, there will be a team that's looking, I'm, I'm kidding. I, please, we're not like going to be mean about winning, right, Kevin, Ben? We're not mean about, we're just here to have fun. But uh, there, are, there are times that you look forward to and that you, that you look to to obtain and to achieve a victory. And what I want to encourage you in today is that that victory is something that's natural for the Christian, that Christians should be naturally experiencing victory day by day because of who Jesus Christ is, was, and will be in our life. Amen? Amen. We know that different parts, different times in, in history, and I'm, I'm going to stick to some sports references here this morning, but uh, the, that there have been times that we've seen humans go above and beyond what people thought were physically or mentally possible for, for, uh, for some humans. Um, Number one is Tom Brady. I know a lot of you love Tom Brady, and you just think he's the greatest of all time. He's the GOAT, right? Does anybody know, does everybody know who Tom Brady is? All right, it's not just me. Okay. I think Tom Brady, I actually do like Tom Brady because he is a reminder that you can do things up past the age of 33, like 45, Okay, he played for 22 years in the uh, in the profession. You know, in the NFL, had seven rings, seven championships, went to ten Super Bowls, and just he had he was surrounded by great coaches, great players, but he was also a great leader. And uh, what he did playing quarterback for that long was pretty incredible. Some kids don't even get out of college playing quarterback, but let, let alone go and play for years and years. Um, but that's he just he he dedicated his life to to being being able to do that and to be strong throughout his career. Brett Favre is another one that played 297 straight games over 18 seasons as quarterback. Again, he dedicated his his work ethic. He dedicated who he was. He was he was driven to to be somebody that played every time there was a football game, and he did that for 297 games over 18 seasons. Uh, there's been home run records that, that were beaten and, and re-beaten and then asterisked because of, of certain players that, that played. But uh, there's been hit, hitting streaks. Joe DiMaggio's, uh, was it 56-game hitting streak? Those of you who know who Joe DiMaggio is, I believe it's 56 games that he got a single in 56 games straight, which was pretty incredible. The, the, the game that he did not get a hit, he hit 18 straight games after that. So, I mean, it wasn't like it was just a fluke that he was able to, to keep going, but it was a, a dedication that he had to his craft or to who he was. Um, Hornsby batting 424, that's something that's been, that's, for those of you that understand baseball, it's not easy to hit 424. That means every 10 times you're at the, at the bat, point, or what, 42% of the time, you get on base. That's pretty incredible in baseball world. In hockey, we have, we've got the Olympics going on. And there's been a lot of uh, reference to the Miracle on Ice team, the U.S. Olympic team, that just shocked the world. And because of their dedication to their sport, dedication to their craft, dedication to, to, to their practice and who they were, they became a team that shocked the Soviet Union and went on to win the gold at the, uh, at the 1970... Nobody? 1972? Two. Two. Right? All right, are we getting that old? I'm not, I, that's, my, that's when I was born. That's 50 years ago, right? That's a long time ago. It's either 72 or 74. That, uh, or no, 82. 
82, that's it, 82, yes. So in 1982, so 40 years ago, they won. Uh, Nadia Comaneci for the, all of the, and I just blew up her name, but she was a, a, an Olympic gymnast in the 70s. She hit seven perfect 10, seven scores of a perfect 10 in gymnastics, which was unheard of. The, you know, these, and I'm, what I'm doing is I'm, t- I'm giving you examples of people that did things that were unheard of at the time that she did, she, she did something that others hadn't done yet, and people were shocked and amazed at how well she did. Uh, Roger Bannister, who's one of, one of the guys I think is pretty cool, he was the first, first, man, first person, male or female, to break the four-minute mile. And that was something that they thought your, your ears would come off if you ran that fast. You know, I'm kidding. There's, but the, the, he challenged records, he challenged speed, and was able to come in underneath, underneath four minutes for a mile which was crazy. You guys know who Usain Bolt is. He's the fastest man, uh, broke records in the 100 meter, the 200 meter, the, you know, he just go on and on, all the things that he did, but it's not because he just decided one day, I'm gonna go run in the Olympics tomorrow, but because he dedicated himself to the craft, to the, to the working out and to the, to the training to become who, who he wanted to be. Uh, Jesse Owens is another one that set Four, four, four world records in an hour. So in one hour's time, he was at a Big Ten track meet. And in one hour's time, less than an hour's time, he broke four world records. So, I mean, this is, the, this, this is incredible. Whether you like sports or not, these are things that are incredible. Uh, Gertrude, I'm not going to say her last name, but she swam the English Channel. She was the first woman to swim the Eng- English Channel. And she did this in 1926. So, I mean, there's, there's just throughout history, there have been events that it looked like uh, a human couldn't do it sports-wise, but they were able to because they put their mind to it, they put their craft to it, and they went against it. Um, there was a time period where South Carolina was beating Clemson five years in a row. So that people thought that wasn't possible, but the team came together and they were able to win five years in a row. And I mean, and it wasn't that long ago, but people have always throughout time, we've always been presented with opportunities where we had to overcome or overachieve in order to get something done, whether it was physically, whether it was mentally, whether it was culturally. We hear a lot about that these days, breaking cultural barriers, breaking social barriers, breaking all sorts of, of barriers so that we can be who we want to be. But we have a great victory. Luke chapter four. Luke chapter four. And we're gonna talk about who that great victory is. And we're gonna start in Luke chapter four. I'm in the New American Standard. Luke chapter four, verse 14. It says that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of, of the spirit. Now what I want what I want us to focus on is that you can do certain things in life. You can do certain things in life through training, through um through through diet. I was thinking about it this weekend that how many times, you know, somebody comes out with a new diet and they're like, "Well, if you'll just eat this way, if you'll cut out whatever or you'll add this and you'll do this, then you'll you'll gain or you'll lose or you'll, you know, get bulk or or whatever." But there's, there's things that people can do that we can do that attest that, that work for our bodies and for who we are and for how we're made and for how we're built. But as you walk over into this new realm of the spirit, which is what we've all done when we've asked Jesus to come into our heart, when we've, when we've confessed Jesus to be our Lord, all of a sudden we have this new thing that totally levels the playing field around us. And you'll see time after time, you see event after event recorded in the Bible. You see event after event recorded in history, how a Christian came in and under, under crazy circumstances, under, under circumstances where it didn't look like they should, they should make it. They, they didn't look like the, the Hebrew children should have been able to survive the, the furnace. It didn't look like Daniel could have been able to survive the lion's den. It didn't look like the blind men that came to Jesus would ever see again. But because they invoked a different power, because they went after a different thing that was beyond themselves, beyond nature, beyond what was natural, all of a sudden they were stepped into this realm of the supernatural. 
And they were able to achieve or have be done to them what couldn't have been done in the natural. So in, ver in verse 14, we see that Jesus returned to Galilee. So Jesus has just returned from being in the desert and being tempted of the devil. See, Jesus, there's nothing Jesus has ever been faced with outside that we will never be faced with. Jesus had every temptation, every, every opportunity to turn away from God, to turn away from serving God, just like we do. So you can't ever say, well, Jesus doesn't understand the situation that I'm in. Jesus doesn't understand the place that I'm at. Jesus, no, Jesus was taken into the desert. He was taken away from his, from his family. He was taken away from what he knew. And he was just given time, 40 days, where he was in the desert to be tempted of the devil. Now, we know of three major temptations, but I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that it wasn't just three major because that's not how Satan does. Satan doesn't just come in and whack you over the head with a temptation. He comes in and he makes it easy. And he's like, well, I can, I can get him here. I can get him with their dedication here. I can get him with their reading here. I can get him with what they're listening to here. I can get him to what they're, what they're watching here. You know, and so, but then all of a sudden, one comes up and he's like, hey, Jesus, Listen, if you're so hungry, why don't you turn this stone into bread? And what did Jesus say? Jesus didn't go, well, I can't do that, Satan. No, he gave Satan the bread of life. And he gave Satan the word of God. Satan comes and says, look, I'll, I'll give you everything that you see. And what does Jesus say? Jesus doesn't, doesn't go, well, no, you can't do that, Satan. No, Jesus says, this is what the word of God says. This is, this, is who, this is who God is in my life. So even during times of temptation in Jesus' life, he was constantly reminded, and guess what? He was constantly saying what the word of God meant in his life, what it was to him in his life. That's how he was able to get through temptations. As we've been talking about uh, being blind and how God wants to help the people that are, that are blinded or that can't see them, well, part of being blind is not confessing the word of God. That if you're not confessing the word of God, you're not giving your life a direction that comes from God. If you're confessing everything else around you, that's, that's continuing to be blind or to walk in blindness. So we see that Jesus returns to Galilee, and it says here he turns to Galilee, 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 Galilee in the power of the Spirit. So because of Jesus's, you know, we'll, we'll say it and you'll hear it. Jesus was not operating as the son of God while he was walking on this earth. He came as a man. He came in the image of man. And then he was anointed by the Holy Ghost. He was baptized in the Holy Ghost. He was, he was transformed. He was taken from this natural human being to all of a sudden now he's walking in this area of the supernatural that he's walking in this realm of the supernatural because now everything that he says and does is modeled after what he sees the Father do and what he hears the Father say. How simple is that? That if you want to walk in the supernatural, you just do what you see the Father do and you say what you hear the Father say. But guess what? It takes spending time with the Father. It takes knowing who the Father is. It takes understanding who God is and making sure that he has that place in your life. So we see that Jesus comes. He's in the power of the Spirit. News about him is spreading throughout all the surrounding region. In verse 15, it says, he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. So obviously, he was very well-spoken and he, was, he, had, he had a great eloquence about him because people were like, hey, I can get with this guy. He's, pretty, he's saying some good stuff. He's saying some pretty cool things. Well, all of a sudden, it says here in verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, whose custom was it? It was Jesus' custom. This wasn't something new to Jesus. That obviously people had seen him and heard him do this before. As was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. And he unrolled the scroll and he found the place where it was written. What I'm talking to you about this morning is a victory that you cannot obtain on your own. What I'm talking to you about this morning is an overcoming that does not come naturally. Everything about this world, even if you're not serving God, everything about this world, everything about this time period, everything about this age is set 
up to bring you down, to take you down a notch, make it so that you are sick, making so that you are tied into to, to, to debt, to, you know, to, the, to, to slavery of the job, if you want to say it. Make, you know, there's so many things in this life that are set up, that are set there just to, to make you fail. And if you're not failing, you think about, well, how do I keep from failing? How do I keep from failing? What Jesus did is he came to overturn all of that. We're going to go somewhere this morning. Jesus came to overturn all of that because we're no longer living in the kingdom of darkness. We're now living in the kingdom of the son of his love that we've been translated. So now we've got to learn a new way of living. Now we've got to learn a new way of thinking. Now we've got to learn, we've got a new coach. Praise the Lord. And this new coach has come in with some different ideas. He's come in with some different energy. He's come in with a different vision for what victory is for his people. We're talking about who Jesus Christ is and who he's supposed to be in our life. It says here that he unrolled the scroll and he found the place where it was written. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Jesus Christ came in and when he, when he came out of the desert, he had a new direction. He had a new plan. He had a new place for his people to be. He rolled up the scroll in verse 20 and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And I like this because it says, all the eyes of the people in the synagogue were intently directed at him. Did you hear what he just said? Did you hear what he just said? Did you hear what he just said? Now, in verse 21, he began to say to them, today, isn't that amazing? Jesus stands up in the synagogue, as was his custom, and he reads from Isaiah the prophet, but it must have been something different in his tone, must have been different, something different in his confidence, must have been something different in what he, the revelation that he had. See, Jesus, but the scriptures tell us that Jesus found himself in the scriptures. So that means from a very young age, he was looking, who am I? What does it mean what, what does this mean? What does all of this mean to me? Why am I here? You know, he had those questions as a teenager and as a 20-something-year-old. And sometimes even as a 40-something-year-old, like, why am I here? You know, what, what am I doing here? But Jesus, he, he, he had found himself in the scriptures. And you know, when he was reading that, that he was reading, he wasn't like, well, you know, like I just read it. You know, the spirit of the Lord is upon. No, Jesus was, was speaking as though he'd been with the Father. Jesus was speaking as though he realized, this is who I am. Jesus was speaking as though he knew that he couldn't live this life. You can live life without God, but there's living life with God. And that kind of living is a victorious living. Yes, there's battles. Yes, there's things that we're challenged yet with. Yes, there's things, there's times it's going to seem, well, we, we lost that or we, you know, this was harder. But listen, there is a victory that only comes from God. And Jesus even realized that in his life. He realized that in his life. He had to die. And to a lot of people, that would seem like he lost. But because of his dying, all of a sudden, we can all live. We can all live and enjoy the same, enjoy the same that Jesus had. Verse 21 says, now he began to say to them, just in case you didn't get this, just in case you don't understand who just read the scripture to you, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing and all the people were speaking well of him and admiring the gracious words which were coming from his lips. So they went from, ah, oh, it's Jesus. That's all, you know, that's incredible. To then somebody, somebody in the back said, is this not Joseph's son? Now, 
there's so many things in our life that you come, you come to church, and listen, when I come to church, and even, I mean, the last 20 odd years that I've been, 30 years now, that I have been dedicated to being in church, that I would leave church feeling a certain way, you know, like I got something out of church today, and I, I, my spirit man was built up today, or I realized who I am in Christ today, or I saw something different about being a husband, or being a father, or, or how to be a better worker, or, you know, I saw that in the scriptures today, that, that that was revealed to me in the word, that was revealed to me in the preaching, but then as soon as I, I got home, or, or, or I got to work the next day, something came up and said, aren't you Brad? You know, isn't, aren't you so-and-so's kid? Isn't that who your grand, you know? And you, you start thinking about things. They could never say, well, aren't you Jennifer's husband? Because like, that's, that's a good thing. You know, that, you talk about making me stand up a little bit, a little bit bowed up a little bit. Or when I had kids, they're like, aren't you Jonah and Silas and Esther and Lily's dad? I'm like, yeah, I am. You never believe it. But when, when, when things in your life come along and they try to remind you of who you were before Christ, those are the things that you have to remember. I've got the victory over that. I've got the victory over that. That's Luke chapter four, verse 14 through 22. We see that Jesus in, in, this, in this passage here, he's talking of things about physical. He's talking about uh, social things. He's talking about religious handicaps. He's talking about these things that, 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 that are being presented. And listen, he's even talking about how to overcome oppression. You know, we know that, that Satan, we talked last week about how Satan is the little G, he's the little God of this world. So he has a time period where he is, where he is able to rule and to reign through people's, on people and through people. This, this spirit of oppression that we deal with. But, but without Jesus, you can't come out from under that. Without Jesus, you can't be, you can't, oh, you don't have victory over that. Because just like in Luke chapter four, verse 14, he's talking about, I came this day to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Today is the day things change. How many of you are willing to say that today? Today is the day that things change in my life. See, Jesus came to heal. He came to give sight to the blind. He came to free us from everything that, that binds us up and keeps us and that holds us back. He came to re come to remove the oppression that Satan, to, he came to snatch us from the claws of death. He came to make us uh, better looking, more responsible, better, better, uh, better, better givers, better receivers. He came to make us better. He came to take you from a place where you're wallowing and trying to, how am I going to get through the next 24 hours to being like, God has got me. God has taken me. God has delivered me. God has, has taken me from this place where, where I was, where I got to. Now we're going to go to this place where Jesus is and where Jesus has got to. He wants you to be where he is. We have a great victory. Some of the things that we do that, that helps us with our victory is our confession. The day that you decided to follow Jesus. Without that day, you never entered the kingdom of God. You know, the kingdom of God is not this building. It's not these people. The kingdom of God is, is, is believing in your heart that God raised, that, that Jesus is, I'm sorry, confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised you from the dead. That is part of your confession. That is part of the great confession that takes you and brings you out of the kingdom of darkness and places you into the kingdom of the son of his love. The first time that you decide to go to church, that was a decision that you had to make. That was a decision that you had to go, okay, that's a change. that I, Today is the day that I'm making up my mind. I'm going to church. I'm going to be obedient to the scriptures and be involved with the body of believers. The first time you tithed, the first time that you gave into the kingdom of God, that was a day that you said, I'm not going to live my life my financial life, my financial being, I'm not gonna live that way, the way that the world does it. I'm gonna go the way God does on this. Because God tells us, he instructs us to bring all the tithe into the storehouse so that there'll be food, so there'll be meat, there'll be something there. If not to take care of the minister, but to take care of the ministry. 
Do you understand that? There's a different, when you, when you decide to do that, all of a sudden your, your financial uh, forecast, your financial future changes because you've invoked the power of God in your life when it comes to your finances. That's something that you have great victory in now. Another thing that gives you great victory is when you have a family that you go to church as a family. That you're together as a family. You know, we were talking about the, uh, the 21 days of prayer and, and Jonah was making the comment, you know, the church that prays together stays together. Or something, you know, he said something like that. But listen, the, the family that, that church is together, they're growing. They're going in the same direction spiritually. We can't lose sight of this spiritual for the future that God has for us spiritually and by us being, being together and doing things spiritually together, that takes our family into a place of victory. I know y'all are real distracted by my Gamecocks shirt here. Look at my eyes, all right? Look at my eyes. Go to 1 John chapter four. 1 John chapter four. You know, I can't, We're talking about victory. We're talking about what gives us victory in life. And you know, there's, there is truth that some people are, we're all, you know, we're not, no two people are exactly the same, but yet there are certain things that, 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 um, that work on some people and don't work on others. You know, there's certain, there's certain, like I was saying, there's certain diets that I can go on a certain diet and, and do and my body acts a certain way. And then, you know, Jonah or Silas can go on, a, on the same diet and their body acts a certain, you know, does something totally different. Because physically, we're not the same. Physically, we're not, you know, we're not, we're not built the same. I mean, yeah, we have the same, we, we look the same. If you look, we, yeah, we both have hearts. I have a heart, okay? We both have lungs, we both have stomach, you know, all those things we have, but we're not physically built the same. And so our physiology doesn't always work the same way. You go to the mind. You go to, to, to how people think. And you go to what, you know, some, um, I love to watch things, okay? I like to watch things and I can learn from watching and, and copying or mimicking what somebody else is doing. I can, that's a really easy way for me to learn. I don't like to sit and read on how to, you know, step one, do this, step two. I don't, I don't like to do that. I get really bored with that. So mentally, my mind works differently than like Miss Pastor Jennifer. Pastor Jennifer likes to read and she reads a lot. And sometimes I feel bad because I don't read as much as she does. But she's a lot, she's more intellectual. She, she thinks more than I do. I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe she just thinks better than I do. But, but, there's, but do you understand what I'm saying? That physically and mentally, we're all at different places. You understand that we're all we're all different things drive us different things motivate us different things inspire us but spiritually that's where we're the same that's where we come together the same because Jesus, like I said, he's the one that makes every, he, he levels the playing field for us. All of a sudden, my strength and your weakness, they don't matter because of Jesus. Do you understand that? Uh, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, uh, verse 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard is coming. And now it is already in the world. So before 100 AD, they were talking about the spirit of Antichrist that was in the world. You better believe the spirit of Antichrist is here today. You better believe that you better, that you've got to have something on the inside of you that helps you to see the difference in what the spirit of Antichrist is and to what the spirit of Christ is. You've got to have something there because if you're not, you're going to follow the false prophets and you're going to listen to what the people that are being driven by the spirit of Antichrist are saying. But listen, here's the good news. You are from God. Everybody say, I am from God. I am from God. 
He says, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Verse five says, they are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world and the world listens to them. I'm just aside here, you're not to be driven by what the world's forecast is. You are not to go the direction of the world's forecast. You are to go the direction of God's forecast, what God says. You know, we're not to be thermometers and telling people what the temperature is. We're supposed to be set. We're supposed to be thermostats and setting the temperature, the environment that we're around by speaking and being the light of the gospel of the glorious, of glorious Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 5 again says, they're from the world. Therefore, they speak as from the world. And the world listens to them. Verse 6 says, we are from God. How do we know that? Verse four says, you are from God. He comes right back in verse six and says, we are from God. The one who knows God listens to us. The one who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. I encourage you as believers as believers in the kingdom of light, believers in the kingdom in Jesus Christ, that you are so taken with, with, with this. We know this. We know if somebody is not willing to listen to what God is saying, you know they are not ones that you need to be getting your information from. Does that make sense? It's important. It's important. Our job is not to bring everybody together. As Christians, our job is not to make this a better world where everybody gets along. Do you understand that? Jesus came and he divided. The moment we see it, we see it when he steps into the synagogue and he tells people, this is who I am. At that moment, people turned. Aren't in this Joseph's son? What kind of authority does Joseph have? Because they were thinking man's thoughts. They were thinking like the world thinks. They were wanting people to stay in this direction that the world, they had, they had it all figured out. The, the Pharisees and the, the, the Sadducees and the, the, the what you see is what you get sees. They all, they had it figured out and they were like, well, this is exactly how God's gonna do things in the future, that the king is gonna come and he's gonna be a king, he's gonna have a king's birth and he's gonna live a king's life. You know, they had this whole idea. They, and these were the people that were religious, these were the people that were so well studied. These were the people that, were, that had taken the scriptures and made it such a part of their life. So they were the ones, why wouldn't you listen to them? But John here says they were from the spirit of Antichrist because they wanted to shoot it down. Go to verse five, I mean chapter five. Chapter five. Verse one. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 tells us, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. How do you know if you're born of God? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? That is how you know that you're born of God. So what does this mean? Everybody who loves the Father loves the child born of him. So that means that if you love Jesus, you love God. John's breaking this down for us. He's like, if you don't know who you are, listen, this is who you are. This is what should be going on in your life. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Verse two says, by this we know that we love the children. When we love God and follow his commandments, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For whoever has been born of God, listen to this, because this is so important. Whoever has been born of God overcomes the world. If you're born of God, and again, John breaks it down here, and he says, who is the one who overcomes the world? Because I know you are all thinking this. I know when I read that, I was like, well, who is the one that overcomes the world? Well, he says this, who is the one that overcomes the world? But the one who believes Jesus is the son of God. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. 
So all this trash and all this junk that people throw at you and tell you, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't do. Your parents were this and your job is this. And, and yet, we watched a movie Friday night and it was about the, the, the movie was The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. Is that right? And you know, and this was, this is in like 2000, I believe is when this boy lived. And it's a true story. And he's, he had this, all these things that could possibly, he was in Africa and it was the desert and it only rained sometimes of the year. And, and they have to be real uh, cautious and careful and, you know, and they're planting stuff when it needs to be planted. I mean, they're like real diligent in how they're working the land and how they're making sure that they've got it in time for the water. And, um, and so the, their, their country is changing like so many countries do and the government changes like so many governments do and their government is trying to, to get the people to depend more on the government is what's going on in this, at this time in, 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 in this country. Was it, what country is it? Is it Uganda? It was something like, huh? Mozambique. Okay, Mozambique. So this is during in the early 2000s. And so they're selling, like people are starting to just give up and they're, they're selling off their property to the government and the government's coming in and removing trees. And what that does is that, that keeps the, the land, the trees were keeping the land from flooding. Well, now if the trees are gone, guess what? The land floods and they can't grow their crop. And if they can't grow their crop, they can't live. They can't, they don't have anything to sell. They don't have anything to eat. And so, you know, you just have all this going on. Well, it, it actually happens that, that people are selling their, their property. The, the waters come and they flood the land and it ruins the crop. And, and this family, it's about this family. And they're like, we've got nothing. You know, they had like 80, 70 ears of corn. They used to have like this whole uh, big room full of corn after harvest. They had absolutely nothing. And so people were like, well, you need to move. You need to go. And like, no, you know. And so this, this, the boy, the, little, the, the son is doing everything that he can inside of himself, looking at, okay, how, how, can, we, how can we help this? And he gets this idea. He's watching, he's watching this um, Oh, he was, uh, the, his, his teacher had this little, he's real interested in electricity, okay? He gets, he gets where he's real interested. I'll, I'll hurry up through this. He's getting to where he's real interested in electricity. And he's like, if I can get electricity to power the water pump, then we can, pump, we can pump water and water the fields and we can harvest at any time. So this is just a little, you know, this is a little boy. And he's like, we can do this. We can do this at any time. So he starts, he gets into, he starts studying. Okay, how does electricity work? And, and what do I need? And he figures out he needs a motor and he needs a, ma- you know, he needs a magnet and wires and all this stuff. And he's real, inter- you know, has an engineering mind anyway. And so he's thinking like this. Well, he has to fight. Listen, people are dying all around him. His family is losing, like people are breaking into their houses. This is a true story. And this little boy is living through this time where his sister and his mom and his dad, and he's got a baby sister, that, that, that their life is just being taken apart right before his eyes. But because he has this dream or he has this vision, I can make the water come out of the ground with, by, with a pump. He understood what a pump did. And he understood if he had electricity and you know, He's in the middle of nowhere, so it's really hard to run a, a really long extension cord out to run. So he's trying how, but it, the wind blows all the time there. And so he's like, I'll just make a windmill. And so, you know, it goes through the process. But the, my point is, is that he had to fight against what his parents thought. He had to fight against what his village thought. He had to fight against what his friends thought. Because he had a dream, he, he knew if we could do this, I can save what's going on. I can save what's happening here. Jesus, I'm not saying this boy is like Jesus, but Jesus knew. He knew, or he wouldn't have said it. It changes today. Your victory comes today. Your I am your victory. It comes today. And so he tells us here in verse five, he says, who is the one who overcomes the world? And this word overcome in verse four, overcome, victory and overcome, they're all the same word. They mean the exact same thing. And guess what it means? That you win. That you win. That you stand at the end and your arms are raised up. And God is saying that you did good, my good and faithful. You're, you, you did it. 
You got through. You confessed. You said what you were supposed to say. You did what you were supposed to do because you were following me every step of the way. So this little boy, let me, I'll finish this up. This little boy, he, he finally, his dad finally breaks down to the point, okay, all right. You can have, like he needs his bicycle. And like the bicycle is the nicest thing they own. It's, the, it's nicer than their house, I think, that it was just really, and he, the boy tells the dad, he's like, if you'll just give me your bike, I can make a windmill and the windmill can generate enough electricity so that it, 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 it uh, fixes up a car battery, charges the car battery, and then the car battery can run the pump. And the dad, at first, he's like, no way. Well, he goes and he tells his friends and his friends are like, we believe you can do it because he's convinced his friends. And so they're like, we'll go with you and we're gonna fight your dad. And so this gang of boys, it's like five or six boys. And some of these guys, I mean, they look mean, you know? I mean, I wouldn't have messed with them. But the dad's like, you can't have my bicycle. How often in our lives do we want to hold on to our past? Do we want to hold on to what got us here when God is saying, come on, I want to take you someplace different. Let's go someplace different. I thought that was a good little, good little message there. The dad's like holding on. He's holding on. I want to farm. I want to keep the land. I want to, you know, and everything around him is dying and it's going away. Well, all of a sudden he's got a saving point of, of we can do something different here. And so the, the dad's like, you can't have my bicycle. And he grabs a big club and he's like, you can't have my bicycle. And the boy's like, we don't want to fight you. I mean, for good reason, right? I don't want to fight somebody with a big old club. But it takes time. It takes more dying. God's speaking to us all the time. God is saying things to us all the time. He's saying, if you'll just make this adjustment here, but we don't. We're like, no, God, this is, this is what I've been doing. I want to keep going this way. But he says, you're the overcomer. If you find that you're in a place where you're like, everything that I do fails. Everything that I do seems to not, I'm not able to get, get to another, you know, we keep hearing the preacher says that I should be living life better and have a better life. Well, what's holding you back? Meaning, what are you holding on to that's keeping you from taking a step further with God? Because God said, if you believe in him, that you're an overcomer. That means that you've got the victory. That means that you're the winner. You win. Luke chapter 5. I want to share a story about a man who was surrounded by people that helped him get the victory. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. It says, One day Jesus, he was teaching. And there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. So remember what I was saying earlier, how when Jesus was, was in, his, in the synagogue and he was talking about who he is and how he's, you know, today is the day that it changes. Today, victory is in front of you. Well, listen, these are the same kind of people that were in this room and they were listening to him also. They were very learned. They were very respected people. They were the Pharisees. They were the doctors of religion. They were the ones who, if you had a question, you went to them and asked them, all right, what do I need to do? Those are the people that were sitting in this room. And it says that they were listening. They were sitting there and had come from every village and from J Jerusalem. And it says here that the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. This is an important line here because where the word is, the results of the word is always there to accomplish it. Jesus, God said that. He said that he watches his word. He watches over it to make sure that it's performing what it was sent to perform. That it's accomplishing what it was sent to accomplish. This is a totally different, different mindset, different way of thinking. As a child of God now, we need to start thinking like this. Our words matter. How we're addressing situations, how we're addressing things. Because Jesus, the son of God, that's, that's already performed. He's already, miracles are already happening around him. People know it. And it says that the power of God was there to heal. Yeah. 
Verse 18. It says, Some men were carrying a man on a stretcher who was paralyzed. Now, is this uh, mental paralysis? You know, is this mental paralysis? No. Is it spiritual paralysis? No. This was physical paralysis. There was something wrong with his body, and he was paralyzed. It says they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of him. So, in other words, they realized they had a problem. They had a problem they couldn't solve. They weren't like vanilla ice, and if there's a problem, yo, I'll solve it. No. It's like, if there's a problem, Jesus is going to solve it. I could have rapped for you if you wanted. But they're like, if there's a problem, Jesus is going to solve it because they're looking to Jesus, the author, the perfecter, and the finisher of their faith. They're looking to Jesus because he's the one that brings the victory. So that's why they went to Jesus. If Jesus couldn't have done anything, they were just wasting their time. Because if it was, if, you know, maybe it only happened for Tammy. You know, maybe it only happened for Luke. So we don't know if it's going to happen for us. No, they knew that if they got this man in front of Jesus, something was going to change. That was going to be the point that that man's life was going to be made new, that it was going to be changed. And so what they did is they brought it. They tried to bring him to him. They, they knew they couldn't get down in front of him by going in through the door. It says in verse 19, but when they did not find any way to bring him in because of the crowd... There's a lot of people. There's a lot of people that are, are questioning Jesus and, you know, who is this man? What is he saying? Who's he, you know, but it's still the power of God was present to heal. You have to remember that. The power of God was present to heal. Verse 19 says, because, because of the crowd, they couldn't bring him in. So what did they do? They went up on the roof. They took him upstairs. They, four men took this guy upstairs that's in a stretcher. They went on the roof, let him in through the tiles and, with a stretcher into the middle of the crowd. And guess what? They got him in front of Jesus. They got him down in front of Jesus. Verse 20. It does not say... Jesus looked up into the roof and go, who removed the tiles? Who's messing with this man's building? This wasn't Jesus' building. He's in this, who's messing with this man? Who did this? Jesus didn't question these man's actions, these men's actions. <laughs> Jesus isn't questioning their actions, but guess what he is doing? He's meeting them where they are. And you know where they are? They're in front of Jesus. They're in front of Jesus. So they've been, essentially, they have said, Jesus, you're the, you're the way here. You're the truth. You're the life. Verse 20 says, and seeing their faith, your faith is not something that you're supposed to keep bottled up on the inside of you or in your mind. Your faith should be seen every single day. Jesus said here, or it says here in the scriptures, this is Luke, and Luke was a doctor. He was a, a medical doctor, so he, he, he's uh, a little more in tune to, to some medical things here, but he's, he says this is what healed him. He says, seeing their faith, he says, friend, your sins are forgiven you. And at verse 21 says, the scribes and the Pharisees began thinking of the implications, saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins except God alone? The only reason you ever question what God says is because you're not born of God. They were questioning what Jesus said. They did not have love for Jesus, so they didn't have love for the Father. They didn't have love for the Father because if they had, they would have had love for Jesus. First John, that's what he said. He said, if you love God, you're going to love Jesus. If you love Jesus, you're going to love God. So it's real simple. And so that we see that these men, they didn't even know who God was. Verse 22, but Jesus, aware of their thoughts, responded and said to them, why are you thinking this way in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then he looked and he said to the paralyzed man, I say to you, get up, pick up your stretcher and go home. At this point, 
nothing's happened. If you stopped right here, we would never know the end of the story. We would never know the end of this historical reference. We would never know the, the end of this if you stopped right here. Because what happens is a lot of times we'll hear the word of God being preached and we'll go, that's good. Oh yeah, that's real good. Man, I'm so thankful for Jesus. I'm so thankful that God sent Jesus. I'm so thankful that God sent his word. And we'll sit and we'll hear it. And we'll be like, this, that was good. That was good. That was good. But listen, this is what's the finisher. This is the kicker. He says here, I say to you, get up, pick up your stretcher and go home. There had to be something that this man would do. This man had to do something to show that he believed in what Jesus was saying. That he believed that the power was there to heal him. He had to show, listen, he had to show, he had to first of all understand the power was there to heal him. The Bible tells us that the power was, it was present to heal. We're, we're staying on healing a lot this morning, aren't we? The power is, but we need this. We've got to have this. This is part of your salvation. This is part of what God, what Jesus, when he came into the synagogue and he said, this day, this day, this scripture is being fulfilled. Now it's up to you in your life. Is it this day that the scripture is being fulfilled? Because Jesus wants to fulfill it. He wants to take you to a new place. He wants to take you to a new level. Hallelujah. He tells the man, he says, he tells them all that are thinking crazy thoughts. He says, your sins are forgiven to the man. He tells the man, get up, pick up your stretcher and go home. And it says in verse 25, it doesn't say the man sat there and thought about it. He didn't go, hmm. Okay, so if I do this, we, we heard one people, one person, <laughs> we heard one person go, well, what will my denominational friends think if I do this? Who are you living for? Who are you living for? Well, what will my parents think if I do this? What would my spouse think if I do this? No. Do you know what this man did? It says immediately. You talk about somebody that got it. You talk about somebody that was like, well, that's for me. Well, that's for me. It says immediately the man was obedient because how do we know he was obedient? It says he got up before them, picked up what he'd been lying on and went home glorifying God. We're talking about victory. And we're not just talking about it for this man on the bed that was paralyzed. We're talking about it for us because John said, he said, if you love God, you're an overcomer. That means you've got the victory. That means that there is nothing that can come against you, that nothing can stand before you. Nothing can, can, can lay itself down and try to trip you up. Nothing can that can't be dealt with. Doesn't say that it won't. But you got to deal with it. You got to deal with it. Verse 26 says, They were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God. They were also filled with fear, saying, We've seen some remarkable things today. We've seen some craziness go on today. You know, I've We'll hear, you know, we've heard testimonies about people that were in wheelchairs go to a service and, and, uh, and, and, and listen, it's the power of God. It's not because some man is so loved by God that he's the one that's got it. No, it's the power of God because it's the same Jesus. It's the same Jesus that was in the New Testament, the same Jesus that was in the Old Testament, the same Jesus that's after Revelation, but you know, the, our lives, it's the same Jesus. But all we have to do is get lined up with that. We get lined up with that thinking. We get lined up with that, with that desire, that heart. Listen, these men, these men, they were just like any other man or woman that tries to overcome something, that tries to, to, to be a great Olympic athlete, that tries to be a great football player, that tries to be a great basketball player, that tries to be a great chemist, that tries to be a, a great president. They're filled, they were filled with the same thing that drives man to want... There is a God-given desire on the inside of you that makes you want to be better. 
because we're made in the image of God. And if we weren't made in the image of God, then I would say, well, don't worry about it. Just fart around and you'll be fine. But God's got something greater for you. Something better for you. A place that goes so place, so much deeper, so much better, so much harder, so much. You can, you know, you can be like Brett Favre and think, well, I, I've, I started all these football games. Nobody's ever going to beat me. Nobody, you know, you can be like that. Or you can be like, you know what? Well, God said that he supplied all my needs according to his riches and glory. And so I just, I get in there and I get with God. And I'm like, God, what is it that's keeping me from experiencing the victory that you have for me? He's got victory for you. It's not for somebody else. It's for you. And it's so much better than anything we could ever do here in this life. Amen. Let's all stand. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I've heard, we heard a, a minister talk about that. The, the guy was like, grabbing four freight that all you need is four crazy friends but it just matter all that matters is that you've got the right people surrounding you helping you stay in the presence of God staying in the place of God that are going to help get you right down in front of Jesus because that's where you need that's where life begins for us that's where life is sustained for us and when we when when he finally comes back and he calls us home and he says, you've done good. you did done good. You finished your course. You fought the good fight. I know it wasn't easy and I know it wasn't hard, but you stayed with me the entire time. And you overcame because you love me and because you love God. And there's so much that you got to experience because of that. We're talking about Jesus. Praise the Lord. Father, we love you and praise you and we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, that your word is truth. And Lord, we can't, we can't come up with these words. We can't come with these words that, that are life. We can't come up with these words that are, that are health. We can't come up with these words that are, that are healing. We can't come up with these words that are redemption. Father God, these are your words. And Lord, I pray that every person that, that hears my voice, whether it's this morning or whether it's down the road, that Father God, that they realize that it's you that loves them. That it's you that's for them and not against them. That it's you that we obtain the victory. That it's in you that we obtain the victory. That we are overcomers. That we're overcomers. And I love how John says it there. In John chapter 5, he finishes it. That that victory, that overcoming life, that victorious life, that, that overcoming that comes is because of our faith. Because we believe in you. And Lord, because we act on what you say. Just like the man that was paralyzed. We had to act. We have to act. And so this morning, if you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart, never asked him to come into your life, whether you're in here, whether you're watching online, you have to act. It's not been, uh, people want to say that it's been predestined who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. No, your destiny's known because God knows the beginning from the end. He knows what you're going to do. But it's still, you got to do it. You've got to confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord. You have to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That's the only way that you can experience this life of victory. This is the only experience, way that you can experience this life of being an overcomer. And in the book of Revelations, it tells, them, tells, us, tells us that we overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. So Father God, help us to testify, help us to, to share that who Jesus is in our life. If there's anybody here this morning that, that is, would like hands laid on them for healing, the Bible says that believers will lay hands on the sick. And the Bible says that they recover. That's the Bible. That's the word that says that. If you would like for us to pray with you this morning, we would love to join our faith with you. If there's anything else that you would like to be prayed for, 
prayed with, agreed, agreed upon, we would love to do that. But God has not left you here to figure this out on your own. He sent Jesus. We're so thankful. So thankful. So thankful. Praise you, Lord. Well, Father, I thank you. I thank you for each person. Lord, I thank you, Father God, for the opportunity for True North Church to be able to come together and to worship you and to lift up the name of Jesus. Sing songs of victory. Sing songs of triumph because we serve the one, the true, the living God, the one that takes us over, takes us over whatever comes our way, takes us through it, takes us around it, takes us under, however it is, we get through because we've got the victory. We thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it. Amen.